That's right. You're exactly right. I mean, that's what Jesus did. He had he made disciples and they went out and made disciples. See what Peter wants to do. It's all up to him. I am in his service. I am his employee. Mm -hmm. I shall go where sent and when sent. Mm -hmm. um, it's good to see everybody. Uh, Patricia, we got Sheila. We got hey. we got Dale hey, lower left. We got Gino lower right. If y'all are having the same thing on the recording or on the live stream uh, that I am, that's the way it looks on my screen anyway. Um, good to see you. I have made a short video that I'd like to share with you. Um, the only thing preliminary I want to say about it is that it involves um, a, video, a short clip from teaching by Robert Capon. Robert Farrar Capon, uh, he's a, um, he was an interesting guy. Uh, Gene and I both met him. I don't know if, if anybody else has. Um, cooking show, show guru on the internet in the 90s, 80s and 90s. He, but he was also a priest and a theologian. He was, uh, he was from New York. And um, I got to meet him and know him pretty well because I had him come down to a large church that I was volunteering serving in uh, the late 90s called Galloway in Mississippi and had him down for about a week. Almost, no, it wasn't a week. It was, it was close, though. It was like four or five days, I think, the better part of a week. And um, uh, he's a theologian and author that has influenced me, a lot of people, and uh, just like the way he puts things. Uh, it might take you off guard because he puts things in a way that are different than perhaps you've heard before. But we agree on much. I think you'll like him. And then uh, the second one is uh, someone reading something that he wrote. And the third one is a song by Sting called, If You Love Someone, Set Them Free. If you love somebody. If you love somebody. All right, so I'm going to share the screen with you. Let's see what happens. All right, we're getting there. And we're going to play right now. Enjoy. Did you share the sound? Oh, I don't know if I shared the sound or not. So, uh, can you hear it? The other thing is that, that God runs the world. Yes. By chance. You know, God is not in the business of poking his finger into the pie. Now, obviously, the Old Testament is full of that kind of history writing in which God does poke his finger into the pie of history and does stuff. And that's fine. We have to look at that. But in the long run, when you examine the world, how many instances of divine intervention in the world's history are there compared to the, in, in the in instances of non-intervention? It's vast. It is absolutely huge that God does not normally intervene. And the mistake of almost all religions is that they are postulated on the notion that God intervenes, that God will intervene for me or intervene for the elect or for whoever, but he will tilt the tables of history for his favorite people. Are you saying that he doesn't? intervene at all or that he no he reserves the right to intervene as he likes but it, just that like, so you're saying he does poke his finger in the pie just when he wants it. yeah and when his policy is not to eat them other two yeah and, and well, god is an honest casino operator nothing is rigged the, the roulette wheel is not rigged the, the shoe is not stacked the deck by decks cards are not marked nothing is wrong everything is fine mm -hmm. uh and he lets it all happen and the laws of chance and probability are totally, in his mind, predictable. They will produce a buck for him. Honestly, doesn't have to touch it. But he does, this honest casino operator, this is God, reserves the right to comp a guest every now and then. <laughs> right? So he is there, it's just unpredictable. That's the way. Well, he's totally unpredictable. That, 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 one, one of the easiest things to realize about the God of the Old Testament is it's not easy to predict. So the point is that uh, it isn't the chance is the enemy of design. 
It's the chance actually is the design. It's the device by which God works this place, by which he operates this casino, and by which he makes a buck off the casino. He gets what he wants. He doesn't get what he wants by slapping the world around. Right-handed power is the ordinary kind of force by means of which we accomplish almost everything in the world. Direct force aimed at producing a direct effect. I squeeze the toothpaste from the tube, turn on the water faucet, raise the toothbrush to my mouth, and clean my teeth by right-handed power, even if I use my left hand to do it. Water is boiled, cathedrals are built, taxes are collected, wars are fought, and love is made, all by right-handed power, by using sufficient energy on suitable material to produce the desired result. In terms of the sheer number of effects that occur in the physical world, perhaps 99.99999% of them are caused by just that kind of power. But as early as the story of Noah, God renounced that kind of power. After strong arming the world with the flood, he put up the rainbow and swore he'd never do anything like that again. Because there is one effect that cannot be the result of a direct application of force. And that is the maintenance of a relationship between free persons. If my child chooses not to cooperate with me, if my wife chooses not to live with me, there is no right-handed power on earth that can make them toe the line of relationship I have chosen to draw in the sand. I can dock my son's allowance, for example, or in anger at my wife, I can punch holes in the sheetrock. In short, I can use any force that comes to hand or mind, and yet I cannot cause either of them at the core of their being to stop their wrongs and conform to my right. The only power I have by which to do that is left-handed power, which for all practical purposes will be indistinguishable from weakness on my part. It is the power of my patience with them, of my letting their wrongs be, even if that costs me my rightness for my life so that they, for whose reconciliation I long, may live for a better day of their own choosing. The power of God that saves the world was revealed in Jesus as left-handed power. And we are back. I felt like something was going wrong. As something on the screen says preparing live stream. I don't know what that means. Are y'all hearing me? Yes. Yeah. Wow. Let me check my I'm having a microphone. I'm having I'm having a speaker problem or something. One We're having second, a background please. noise again, too. Hang on, let's see if I can fix it.
while you're trying to fix it, is anyone to get a copy of that statement that he read? Say what? I said, while you're working on that, I'm just asking, is there any way to get a copy of that statement he read about right-handed and left-handed? Yeah, that's just a YouTube video. I have the link. I can give you the All right. link. All right. Yeah, I just played the whole YouTube video. Somebody put a little short quote in there, you know, and, and read it. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you liked it. Um, uh, in some, I, you know, his talking at the table there, he was talking about, and again, this is remarkable to me. He was talking about how um, chance is the way that God runs the universe, which fits really well with evolution, which is God's choice as well. Um, and that um, intervention by God is it God's choice, but that the huge majority of the time, 99% or whatever, God doesn't poke around with his fingers in the pie. You know, that God shows restraint. Now, think about what I said on Sunday about Sin Soon, about uh, the movie uh, The Life of Pi, about how Sin Soon is uh, a Kabbalic uh, theological or philosophical idea of God withdrawing from a certain space in order to allow the laws of physics and human freedom to operate without God's overwhelming it with God's presence, that uh, God backs off humbly and gives space for the universe to exist with certain rules, laws, and human freedom. So that pairs nicely with the idea of left-handed power. It pairs nicely with the idea if you love someone, set them free, because in, in most things, in most things in this world, we collect things, we earn things, we change things, we operate things with right-handed power, but in relationships, it doesn't work. Power and control des destroys relationships of trust. Because then you just use other people in order to exercise your own power, right-handed power. That's what oppression is, you know, um, and all the things that support oppression, like racism and sexism it's, it's all about right hand it's about about control um so i like uh i like the song I li i've always liked sting's song if you love someone let set them free because in relationships when you set them free it's risky because there's chance either he or she might respond or he or she might not it's risky but you can't hold a gun to someone's head and say love me or else and expect it to work that's right-handed power operating in the left-handed realm. And also, by the way, the cross, I think, is a good example. The best example, the clearest example of left-handed power uh, that we've ever seen on Earth. And I want to talk about all of those things or any of those things that you want to. Gina, uh, I only start with you because you've met Robert for our k uh, um, I don't think, Dale, have you met him, Dale? No. You know, you know, a lot of people don't know of him. Had you heard of him before? <coughs> Dale, had you heard of him before? No, I have not. I'm sorry. Okay. No, I have not. What's up, Gino? I think the first time I heard his name uh, was in one of our meetings at Sessions Farm. And if I recall, you were doing devotional that day, that month. And you didn't even give it much of a preface. You just said, what do you think about this? And read something. And it was just, wow. And I was like, I was afraid to say some of that out loud. And this guy put it in a book. Yeah. He's, he's, he's bold with the truth. And a pretty good cook. Yeah, from what I understand, he uh, was quite the cook. Uh, he was a TV chef. How do you become a... a uh, a theologian, author, an Episcopalian priest, and TV chef. I don't know, but it sounds very fun. <laughs> what, what is the, the King James language? Jesus was, Jesus was a glutton and a wine bibber. <laughs> okay, Bond was in good company. Yeah. And he knew the Gospels well, and he loved the parables and wrote... Um, a series of books, I think it was a trilogy on Jesus's parables, parables of grace, parables of the kingdom, and parables of judgment. I think you can get them now in one volume, I don't know, but they're worth, they're worth the money. Uh, in fact, 
there's a better, much better book than, than that if you want to get deep. And, and uh, Gene and I have told you about it a million times by Ken Bailey. Uh, through Peasant Eye, Poet and Peasant and Through Peasant Eyes is also in two, two in one volume. And, uh, and I recommend that first, but uh, maybe I should recommend Capon first because it's, it's, it's more user friendly. It requires a little less, uh, what, what should I say, academics? And more, a little more, uh, it's, it's easier to read, more practical, down to earth. I think it would get more traction with laity. Yeah, I think so too. I think it'd be something that that laity would like. Uh, I think that again, if you expect it to confirm what you've heard all your life, uh, I, I'm, you're going to be confused or disappointed. But uh, he has something to say, or uh, had something to say, and his his legacy lives on. He's made such a huge difference in people's lives. He's the he's the nicest guy you ever want to meet, and he's funny. And I uh, really enjoyed spending time with him and driving him around. We had a great time. I, uh, I'm sad that he's gone. I think he died in 2012, 13, 14, somewhere in there. Um, so theologically, where are we with this? I'd love to hear uh, your thoughts as you were watching and your, your questions. Dale, uh, where are you right now? I'm still trying to uh, hear what, what what was read to me, not just what he said in the room, but you know, it, the, actually for me, the music playing with it was very distracting. I was trying to really listen and it just kept kind of distracting me. But when you got down to the right hand, left hand and, and the idea of, you know, God is allowing, I think, I think that's the word I would use. God is allowing, you know, God is there, but God is allowing everything. And, that's a position I don't think the uh, traditional conservative churches today are even uh, thinking about at all, where God is not in control, where God is just allowing, because most people say, well, God's in control. And I hear, the, I hear that a lot, don't you? God's in control, um, yeah. that everything happens for a reason, that, um, that uh, everything is God's will, it was meant to happen. That's the opposite of, of uh, what we see in real life and what we see from Scripture. The, the idea is that um, there'd be no human freedom if God didn't allow it. And to allow it, as the Kabbalah, Kabbalic literature says, that whole Simsun thing is a humbling act of self-withdrawal, self-restraint, self-removal, self-shrinking, uh, self-contracting, um, in order to give us this bounteous free space that we live in that's both dangerous and wonderful. I also think that if you don't allow the freedom, you're so bound up with fear and indecision and even the idea of reality. And when you start listening to what people say about, you know, God's in control, well, what, mm -hmm. what does that actually mean? You know, how far down the line are you going to take that? Or, it's God's will. Well, if it's God's will, then God's a pretty daggone mean God at times. That's right. Because if, if, if you know, we had a girl in our community jump off of a boat last year and never came up out of the water. She was 17 years young. And the theology of some people was God took her home. God, had, God needed her more than we did. Well, yeah, yeah. And, you know, when you start talking about control or, or the lack of freedom, in a sense, if, if you start running that concept to the very end, it's crazy when you think about it. It's really crazy because you're putting God in a position where God is extremely angry, destructive, uh, bitter, hateful, and that contradicts the scripture completely where God is love. Yeah. I think I agree with you, Dale, but I'm still kind of um, stuck on uh, things are happening by chance. I'm not sure I'm getting that. And what does that mean? The things happen by chance. But I, I, I see God as one who planned and orchestrated 
you know, made the world, made human beings and put some things in place. And yeah, I know we have free will. But do we, I do know we have free will. I'm not sure this by chance piece, I'm a little bit confused by that. And what do you mean by that? It, is it by chance where you think possibly where we don't have control over it, maybe? Uh, I've used illustrations and sermons many times where you go up in the morning and life happens. You have no control of what's going to happen that day. All of a sudden, you wake up with some situation where you didn't do anything to deserve it in a sense, or you didn't do anything to cause it. It just happened. I don't call that chance. I just I would just say that's life that I can't control. I hate so maybe chance is something I wouldn't use. I don't believe in chance or luck anyway. I don't even use the word luck because I don't I don't believe in luck. But well, you know, but the chance. Young, the young lady in the boat. I mean, if we could just continue that analogy, it might be helpful because what are the options to explain why that young lady drowned that day? What are the, what are the alternatives? God did it. Yep. Or, or um, there is no God and uh, it's just one of the accidents of a cold, cruel universe. Or could it be that God's core nature is humble and God's intent is to exercise that humility to the nth degree, creating a free space for a universe to operate on its own rules and then to join that universe by emptying himself of his godness and becoming human? Or could it be that God could have saved her and chose not to. And because of free will that someone else could, or she could save herself, or why wouldn't God save her? You know? So that's chance. I think. Lots of things could happen, but I mean, they, they're happening. Uh, a lot of things happen by chance. Um, we, we all know people who have gotten COVID and died or been in a car wreck and died or um, grown old and died. I mean, uh, these are these are things that are, are tragic and hard to handle. But um, are they the hand of God torturing us with painful losses, or are we talking about a God who loves us enough to join us in our pain and losses? I think that um, it was. How do I want to put this? It was an unfortunate accident. Um, you hear people say, well, you know, God, why did God just, you know, let her jump? Or why, why was it she just accidentally fell off and he didn't help her? Or, you know, you hear so much of that, I, 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 you know, with anybody that has passed away or whatever. I have to look at it, and for myself, I have to look at it. It was just an unfortunate accident. Um, it happened. And she'll be with God one day. This is how I look at it. Um, and I don't think I could do that if we hadn't had some of these studies. So I'm thankful to be here with some studies that you've had because we've talked about that, you know, that you just don't die and go up, okay? So to blame God for what had happened, I can't blame him for that. I, I can't. And when I hear that, I just kind of get the chills because our God's a loving God. Our God is a forgiving God. Our God is just almighty. And he would never, in my mind and heart, I don't think he would ever deliberately want someone to die. I really don't. Um. If, I mean, we've heard people being sick and terminally sick and they they pass 
you hear people say, God didn't want them to suffer any longer. Okay, well, I don't know that for a fact because I can't talk. I mean, I can talk to God, but he's not going to tell me that, yeah, I took Joe today because I didn't want him to suffer. You know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we just have to... We just have to stay in a frame of mind that God is who he is. And... And if he did take somebody's life, we have to accept that because God is who he is. Yeah, but I, I know a lot of times we hear too, you know, what it wasn't God's will for her to live or wasn't God's will for this and all that. And I, I don't believe that. Um, you know, it's like, it's almost like anything that doesn't work out when we pray about something and it doesn't work out that, oh, it wasn't God's will. It's almost like a cop out for, to, to me when I hear that. Um, I used to say the same thing too, because it was, I didn't have any other answers. It was like, right. I said, I, you know, speak those things to be not as though they were. And I'm spoken all these scriptures and then it doesn't work quite work out that way for me. And so I'm like, well, okay, I don't know how to fix this now. So I guess it wasn't God's will. So that was the easy way out. And uh, for me, that's just a cop out. Um, I'm reminded so. of your friend that you talk about from time to time who y'all prayed and prayed and prayed for her mm -hmm. to live and then she didn't. And then the question was, maybe, maybe God doesn't work this way. Maybe I've got something wrong because this doesn't seem, I don't have an answer for why, you know, she died mm -hmm. when we were praying yeah. for her not to. Yeah. If you're doing everything that is, the scripture says, then maybe it doesn't work quite that way. And my uh, whole theology around prayer um, has changed um, tremendously. Um, go ahead, Dale. But, you know, in that conversation you two just had, isn't also the, I've heard this said, you just didn't have enough faith. Mm -hmm. You prayed, but you weren't believing. And, mm -hmm. and that's why it didn't work, because you just didn't really trust God for the answer. You weren't believing when you started praying. Yeah. I mean, I've heard that said to me many times mm -hmm. over the years. Me too. We're always, we're always looking, you know, we don't have answers, so we're always looking to blame somebody because we don't have the answers of why something doesn't work the way we expect them to work or want them to work. Mm -hmm. Blame is the easiest way. Blame God. And I was in the church Sunday, and uh, the comment was made more than once. Well, it's not God. It's blame the devil because it's the devil doing it. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, we, we, we blame because uh, we have questions or we don't have answers. We give the, the we give the devil too much credit. Any is too much. Huh? Any is too much. Right. Yes. Yeah, zero credit. Mm -hmm. You know, my, my little rationalization is that um Patricia, the plan was in the creation. God's plan was in the creation, and that you know, that's the laws of DNA and gravity and science. And then God stepped back and said, now let's see what they do with it. Yet we pray as though we expect God to change the rules, mm -hmm. nature and DNA and science to fix what we want yeah. fixed. And I, I just don't think God works that. No. And let's see if I can put this, uh, this is a new thought, but may, maybe, maybe, um, Maybe the whole fixing thing, um, you know, we want God to fix things. Obviously, we, we pray for people's health and welfare, obviously. Um, what, what do we what are we doing when, when uh, we're dealing with uh, these kinds of situations where there's something obviously bad happening? You know, we we. <laughs> The easy, I guess the easiest thing to do is to just blame God or to attribute it to God saying that, you know, everything's God's will, so I just have to kind of accept it. It's sort of like a uh, resignation to karma, you know, um, like the universe is paying me back for my, my ills. And then if I pray for someone that I love and then they don't get well and they die, then 
It's my fault because I did something wrong and God's punishing me by letting her die. I mean, the, the gymnastics that we do is unnecessary because the DNA and the quantum physics and uh, the relativity and gravity, um, all, all of the fabric of our cosmos, if Gene, uh, to follow up on Gene's comment, if that's the nature of creation, then um, perhaps what we should be looking at is the, in, in the, the incarnation, okay? Talk about a finger in the pie, but it's not the kind of finger in the pie that you expect. It's, uh, it's the finger uh, and the hand and the whole body and all that God is joining the pie. Put your whole self in, you put your whole self baptized, in. <laughs> baptized into the pie. Speaking of pie, the life of pie was what I preached on Sunday, and it was all about this, about, about God choosing to run things and allow chance to be real, which means that this is a dangerous universe. You know, there are accidents and there are asteroids, as I said on Sunday, but it's also uh, a beautiful universe because we have all of these wonderful things to experience, if we're fortunate, for a few years, and uh, it's, a beautiful, it's a beautiful thing to have relationships and people to love and serve and it's a beautiful thing to drive around this country and for example and see all of its the natural beauty there's a lot of great things about cosmology that I love um but you talk about an intervention that's sort of an anti-intervention that the intervention wasn't to come in and stick the finger in the pie and change the change the uh the course of history and meddle with the course of history but in this case, it's to join God's story to our story by God becoming human. And that's a, that's a cannonball right in the middle of the pie for God. And think about all the reduction that has to take place, all the emptying, all the humility of God to empty himself, as Paul said, of equality with God in order to be a servant, in order to be human, to be found in human form and to serve and to suffer. See, this is, uh, this is anti-meddling in a way. This is not just a finger in the pie. This is John, you know, Jesus jumping into pie. Like your video, uh, what, two weeks ago about baptism when the kid does a cannonball in the baptistry. Yeah, cannonball in, into the baptistry. That's, that's God coming in. <laughs> God backs off to allow creation, and then God backs God's, even God's own nature off in order to join that creation. And by the way, there's going to be a third chapter to this story. There's the creation, you know, there's, well, there's like, like four chapters. Then there's um, incarnation, uh, redemption, and then in the end, consummation. And all of them involve God deeply rooted in what does a humble God do? So I'm thinking that also on, on the last day, on Re Resurrection Day, that the consummation, that that's going to be an ultimate act of humility, too, but I haven't worked out fully my theology of consummation. I'm working on it. I expect it to be identically humble to the way in which God died for redemption, to the way in which God emptied himself for um, incarnation, and the way that God withdrew to allow for creation. These are all selfless acts for the sake of our freedom and a universe that operates without having to be wound up and pushed all the time. Oh, we've got some uh, we've got some people here with us. Uh, Robert Larson is saying thank you for sharing this. Um, and uh, Catherine Chitwood is saying hi, y'all. And Gerald Howard, uh, if God gave us all that we pray for, His plan would not play out. Hey, Gerald, let me uh, help me with that. What's Gerald saying, Gene? Is that our Gerald? Uh, if God gave us all that we pray for, his plan would not play out. Okay. We'd undo it all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, y'all would undo it all. I'd do it right. <laughs> of course, Gene. <laughs> of course you would. That's fine. <laughs> 
But I think to um, to go back to the right um, right hand left hand um, is that what it's called? Mm -hmm. right, um, right handed power and left handed power. Right. I started to think as as they were reading that about codependency, like people who are codependent, like you do everything for this adult. I mean, don't ask any questions. You kind of pick out their clothes with the way you tell them where to go, where to sit, what to do. I mean, this codependency, like they can't think for themselves. There's no freedom in that. Mm -hmm. I, I, that's one of the things that came to mind as I was listening to that. I'm still trying to get a grasp of the right hand, left hand, because the first line of the reading said, like right-handed power was ordinary power. Yes, every day. Ordinary in which way? Like- You pick up your glasses. Is mm -hmm. right handed power. Okay. Anything that you do, anything that you do is right handed power. Every it's the universe operates as he said 99% plus on right handed <laughs> power. On right -handed power. Um, and some of it's bad and some of it's good. It just depends. It's not a moral thing, it's not right or wrong, it's just is that in, in this universe, right handed power gets things done. That's why we have electricity, computers, and internet, right-handed power. But it doesn't work in relationships. You can't force them to work. You can't maneuver them with right-handed power because it requires a free commitment of the other person and your ability to let go of control of them. If you love someone, set them free. Sim sum, you back off and give people room to be wrong. That's called grace. And it looks like weakness, as Capon said. It's indistinguishable from weakness. Like Jesus on the cross, dying mm -hmm. is indistinguishable from weakness. But that was left-handed power. Left-handed power. And you know, one of the things he said about parables, I had to go back and look it back up again, um, just reinforces, I wish you to tie that together for me a little bit better. But okay. he said, par parables are true only because they are like what God is like, not because they are models for us to copy. But, you know, when we start copying them, we, we give in to the right-handed power. We realize it's what God is like, that's the left hand. Mm -hmm. That makes sense? I think so. Um, yeah, a, a great deal of Jesus' parables are in large part descriptive of who God really is compared to who God thinks, who people think God is. It's a corrective, mm -hmm. the, the parables are corrective of God's character, nature, yeah. and purposes and work. And um, in the parable, you know, the, the father um, runs to the son mm -hmm. and, and, and hugs him, which is not expected especially if you look at it through the eyes of Middle Easterners. It's just not expected. You don't expect the God character to be um, forgiving like that. You expect him to be correcting. Because mm -hmm. what the kid did would needed correcting. But instead, he did the opposite. What mm -hmm. kind of father is this? Well, that's that left-handed power. Um, the question is, did it have the power to get the attention of, well, it got his attention. It got the attention of the older son. He was very angry. Because mm -hmm. it wasn't fair mm -hmm. that his uh, younger son who acted that, the younger son who acted that way, his little brother, uh, should be received back like this. Mm -hmm. uh, did not win any brownie points? What about me? Me, me. You know. But uh, left-handed power uh, forgives and never gives up on relationships. Mm. And God doesn't give up on us. Don't know why. You know, Jane, when you mentioned that about parables and, you know, seeing God, uh, what went through my mind when you were making that statement and listening to Bert also, was that how the information we believe have about God is almost not, uh, it's almost unbiblical because we're taught by other things other than the, mm -hmm. the scripture itself. And, you know, if the parables are, as you say, and I agree with that, then we should delve into the stories that the, the Gospels have about who God is from the perspective of the words in the scripture 
instead of delving into what somebody implies to us what God is by what they've learned somewhere else. Well, do you dare to suggest that we read the Bible? Well, I dare that not only read the Bible, but delve, delve into it and, and allow it to be the, the, the information we need to have a better understanding of God in our lives. Because I think that's the, I think what we're talking about with what you just said about the parables is, is part of the essence of what Bert's talking about in the Bible study tonight. I, I see a great correlation between the two. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can't tell you the number of folks through the years, though, that have said, don't tell me what the Bible says. I know what the Bible says. That's not what the Bible says. And I had just read it out of the Bible. Mm. And that's well, see, that's that not interpretation. That don't seem right. <laughs> no, that ain't how you do it. This is how you do it. Mm. <laughs> oh, Lord. This is... Uh... This is right up there at the edge of, I know, the comfort level for probably some people. I, I, I get that. <clears throat> um, the, the, for me, issues of faith and understanding God, something in me demands that my best questions get addressed. And that I think critically about what I'm seeing and reading and hearing and experiencing. Mm-hmm. And what, I, what I'm seeing here, and I hope to convey tonight, is a consistency um, in, in the way that uh, in, in God's interference. First of all, God usually doesn't interfere because God trusts us and really believes in human free will and honors it, you know? Mm-hmm. And that's a humbling thing to realize that God backed off to allow cre- creation to operate freely and not overwhelm it yeah. with God's power. Pre- you know, creating that, that sim sum space, metaphorically, if you will, from the Kabbalah, uh, Jewish mysticism. Um, and then in, uh, in incarnation, again, an emptying of all of that power to become a human. And then for Paul to write that... Um, the fullness of God dwelt in him bodily. Which is really interesting because that's true because in Christ, God emptied God's self of equality with God. So, so this, this emptying is a humble thing. This backing off is a humble thing. This left-handed power is a humble thing. The cross is left-handed power, humble thing. Um, and I, I do believe that in the end, in the consummation on Resurrection Day, that it, we will, the, the thing that will stand out for us most is um, an ultimate act of humility. And I just don't know what it is yet. I'm, I'm working on it. I think we've got hints in the book of Revelation and, and in the Gospels. Um, and I think, I think they're there. I'm working on it. Yeah. There's a consistency. There's... We see God acting similarly in all of these key moments. And it's beyond just sticking your finger in the pie. You know, you just do that to check and make sure it's, you know, cooked all the way through or whatever. But I mean, we're talking about God becoming a part of it, joining it. That's that's beyond cooking. As I mean, even Capon would say, I don't think I could fit my whole self in the pie. But God somehow managed to. Mm. So, now this question is going to probably seem off, but why do we pray then? There you go. So, because, Gene, you said something earlier that's profound about the DNA and everything has already been made as it is with science and, and how and things are in place, and then he took his hands off of it. So if that is true, then why do we still pray? Is where I'm what I'm thinking, because I've been just been thinking about that from you said it. And I yeah, and I understand that to some degree, why if I'm if I'm an hour from the airport and the flight is leaving in five minutes, no matter how much I pray and say, God, I need to catch this flight, please help me get the flight. 
I'm not going to catch that flight, even though I'm praying. You know, the scripture says, you know, everything we pray and desire and pray, believe that we receive it, we shall have it. If so why two, am I not going to get it? You needed two or three more in your car and you could have, you would have had it covered. <laughs> if I would. If you'd have had two or three in the car with you praying, you'd have had it covered. <laughs> right? Because we're three or four gathered together and all that. <laughs> no, it doesn't work. Um, yeah, it doesn't work. So why um, wouldn't it work? So why why do we pray? Um, to set your clock way, to leave earlier to get to the airport. Um, <laughs> to add a word to the conversation that might be helpful. Um, do our prayers influence or change what God is planning to do? Mm. Yeah, I mean, the idea for most people is that prayer is getting God to do what you want God to do. And that sounds selfish, I know, but in desperate situations, that's what it boils down to sometimes. Mm -hmm. and, and there's a difference between influence and impact. Yeah. And I'm, and I'm reminded of the movie Shadowlands. God, I love Anthony Hopkins, 85 years old. Um, when he's playing C.S. Lewis, uh -huh. and, you know, and they say, are you going to pray to make your wife's cancer go away? He said, that's, that's not why I pray. I pray because I can't help but be with God. I pray because I need it. I, I pray because it's part of my being like breathing. I, I don't pray to change God. I pray to change me. Mm -hmm. And that changes everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if we can think of prayer less as, you know, a letter of request mm -hmm. and more as a hug. Mm -hmm. A relationship it's building. Presence. It's a right. presence. It's a relationship. It's a conversation. And, oh, God, please, I hope this doesn't happen. Oh, God, please, not this, as Jesus said in Gethsemane. Um, and yet um, it was about trying to it's it's about asking for the strength to as as um william not was it william wallace who said in the movie braveheart god help me die well remember yeah. before they yeah. executed him well they took him up drew him and quartered him drew him and quartered him and you know his idea was that dying well would mean that i would not give them the satisfaction of screaming for mercy and and uh, screaming no no no, but instead keep silent and then <clears throat> shout for my country in protest of this outrageous act. Mm. And so it was a shadowing, uh, a mirroring, uh, an homage to the cross. And of course, he's lying in a cross position. I think on the on whatever that thing is. What do they call it? A giblet? I don't know what they call it. Gibbet. Gibbet. Yeah, giblet comes with gravy. Gibbet is giblet, giblets come with gravy. <laughs> giblet does not. Gidget was uh, Sally Fields, but anyway. And Gidget um, was Sally Fields. <laughs> we digress. <laughs> yes. Get me out of this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, Robert Robert K. Fon is a, a a wonderful was a wonderful man. I'm glad I got to know him. Um, he, his quotes are so pithy, you know, he's just got a, a million of them. And one of them that I liked is he said, um, heaven is completely filled with sinners saved by grace and hell is completely filled with sinners saved by grace. Just knocked me <laughs> off my chair when I, read, when I read that. I talked to him about it. We had a great conversation. Pretty cool. Mm. You know, you have a lot of people. Um, I've been I, let me back up. I've been around a lot of people who, when we talk about prayer, will say, "Well, pray that they have a good flight. Pray that they make their connection. Pray, that mercy. pray that." Mm -hmm. And I, I just look at them and say, "I'm not praying that." They'll go, "Well, why not?" I said, "I'm not going to tell God what to do." I said. That's not the purpose of prayer, but that's what you're trying to do is making sure, just like uh, we live in, it's not Tornado Alley, but there are a lot of tornadoes in the area where I live in. And when when the alert comes up, it's like pray that the tornado doesn't hit us or pray that God takes the tornado somewhere else. 
it's the attitude they have about prayer. You know, right hand, left hand. It's it's the attitude they have. What they expect of God, and we basically end up trying to tell God what I want God to do for me. And wouldn't that be a terrible world to live in if everybody had the same ability to tell God what we wanted God to do? For yeah. us in every moment. So you praying for the if I'm praying for the tornadoes to come and you praying that it doesn't come, I mean like who who that's kind of like a, a Friday night football, two teams playing, one praying, you yeah. know, God let my team win. Well uh-huh. we God's gonna be on. <laughs> I just gotta lose. <laughs> And when you know, when I was in the hospital with my blood clots, you know, I, I I just about died twice. But I never once asked God, not once. You didn't bargain. Hmm? <laughs> you didn't bargain. No, I didn't bargain. <laughs> not at all. Uh, no. I, I I talk to God about my Parkinson's, but I don't hold it against God when I still have it. Right. Well, yeah. The Apostle Paul uh, was sick until the day he died. Hmm. I have learned to say, may it be your will. Let your will be done. And that's a way of, of surrendering, of letting go of, um, that, that's, that's good. That's, a, that's, that's good trust language, I think. Sheila, good for you. I, I, I can go along with you on that for sure. Early in ministry, Dale, I had a family that I went to visit a person, found a room full of people. They were all upset. And uh, I said, what, you know, tell me what's going on. I said, well, we need you to pray. Well, being young, dumb, and full of it, I stepped to the, the, the bed and said, and, and what? Never ask a question you don't know the answer to. What is it that I'm about to pray for? Pray that Bubba and P so they don't have to put in a catheter. Maybe we should lay on hands. <laughs> and I said, would you bow with me for a moment of silent prayer? <laughs> and my actual prayer was, God, how do I get out of this? <laughs> and I don't remember how I did. But I didn't, I didn't lay on hands, and that was not what I prayed. Oh, boy. I thought of about five <laughs> pithy things that I could say, Gino, did, but did I you should say pithy. I should, yes, pithy. You said pithy? Pithy. I thought of several pithy things to say about mm-hmm. what you just said. Yeah. Actually, that is a pithy thing that I just said about what you just said, but I didn't mean to do it. <laughs> but, but what you're talking about, Gene, is something I think is very real because oh, damn. If, you oh, start, yeah. if you start, that kind of theological road, you know, going down that theological road, God's going to be, we're going to be so disappointed with God. Mm-hmm. I mean, we, we, we'll just be disappointed because, you know, it's a laughing matter we talk about, but there were some people dead serious about you praying about that for him. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we, we end up praying things that we try to, by basically push God into a corner where God will respond because we expect him to respond the way that we want him to. Mm-hmm. Instead of, as Sheila says, and I think it's a very good statement you made, Sheila, mm-hmm. understanding the will of God and allowing the will of God and accepting that as what we see happen. Mm-hmm. It's not a, prayer is not a change agent where we go out magically making things all better. <laughs> but a lot, of people, a lot of people's theology is that way. Yeah. A lot of people don't do the left hand. They always want to have the right hand going. Mm-hmm. How is this related to um, to the, what do they call it, the penal substitution theology where um, um, they interpret the cross as being God pouring out, venting God's own bloody wrath uh, that what God wants to do to us and doing it to Jesus instead, so that the cross is, is, is God torturing Jesus. Punishment for us. Or substituting Jesus for us. Yeah. Hmm. I mean, when we, when we play that game of God's will, 
and we look at the cross, and in, instead of seeing it as the scriptures do, as God forsaking God in Christ Jesus, and we see a torturing ogre who hates us pouring his hate for us out on his own son. And that interpretation seems to fit pretty well with the whole idea that God's will and, and um, I don't know, maybe it even triggered it. I haven't thought about it before. Maybe one really triggered the other. The, uh, the penal substitution may have triggered the idea that, um, I don't know, it may go back to the whole God's a torturer idea. But it's amazing to me how, how widespread that is. I just wish people would talk less, uh, uh, I mean, would realize that if you don't know the names for hell in the Bible and Hebrew and Greek, you probably ought not to be talking about hell. You have not done your homework. Stop it. <laughs> Watch one of our videos about it, please. Um, Catherine and uh, Gerald have uh, comments. Yeah, I see that. Um, <laughs> whoops. And just as you said that, my <laughs> Dell delivery jumped in the way. Okay, so... Um, so Catherine says that prayer reminds us that God is there for us. Um, did your earthly parent, ooh, I'm getting, I'm hearing my voice back now. Um, your earthly parents, did your earthly parents give you everything you asked for? No, that would have been a bad idea. Some of the things my children asked for were definitely not stuff that would have been good for them. And I'm the adult and I make decisions. Of course. Yeah. Um, uh, so, I mean, the, the idea being there, I guess, Catherine, uh, that I can affirm is that, uh, can we just trust that God knows what's best for us better than we know ourselves? Mm -hmm. Maybe that would be a good way to start. Um, Gerald says, if you have a problem, you do all you can on your own, and then you pray about it. And if you don't pray about it, um, you have not done all you can, God's will be done. Um, I didn't exactly fuck track with there, Gerald, but I'm looking at it. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that personally, for me, that you know, Jesus and I kind of privately checking things out. I mean, that's checking in, uh, walking, living. You know, I. Part of, part of my growing in, as a disciple has been realizing that when I'm having fun with Patricia and we're walking through the state park, that um, that's not separate from the God time that I do on Sunday morning. That is God time. You know, I don't, I don't, I've, I've worked really hard to integrate my conversations and experiences of Christ in all environments and in all times, as opposed to relegating it to, well, I've been bad on Saturday night and I went out and got drunk, like one parishioner said to me, yeah, I'm really hung over this morning, but thanks for beating me up. <laughs> now that I've gotten my whooping, I can go, I can go home with my week and have a good mm -hmm. week. And then Saturday I'll go get drunk again. And then mm -hmm. and you can come beat me up on Sunday morning and fix it all. I mean, this is magical thinking. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's not the way prayer works in my experience. Yeah. So you beat him up from the pulpit and re reinforce the fear that he already had about God. Well, that's, mm -hmm. that's the way he saw it, but he clearly wasn't listening to my sermon because I said the opposite. Well, I'm just saying, though, uh, that's what You're happens right. a lot of times because that's the theology of the church today is we got to beat you up bad enough so that you can be afraid of God as much as possible so you can do the right thing and get it right with God. Well, all we have to do is begin with God as a torturer, and people are automatically afraid. And when they're afraid, they're controllable. And when they're controllable, we're using right-handed power. And when we're using right-handed power, we're controlling, manipulating, and abusing. And we need to stop it. Oops, I didn't hear that, Sheila. You're, you're muted. I said, hey, that's uh, how I was brought up. Uh, yeah, so many of us were. And it's hard to deprogram from that. I, I work on it all the time. And I wasn't nearly as steeped in that theology as you and Patricia, probably, being the son of a United Methodist pastor. I didn't, I, I didn't, you know, I had another, 
I had an angle on this thing. I had a different angle on this thing, mm -hmm. but I sure heard it everywhere I went and all the other churches I went to. And I went to a lot of them because in high school, I was, in, you know, I had lots of friends in different churches and I, I, I went to all of them, mostly Baptist because, you know, most people in, in my area were Baptists, mm -hmm. Southern Baptists. And so the right hand would celebrate your salvation and the left hand would celebrate you being a disciple. Oh, wow. Yeah. Oh, that's, ooh, that's, ooh. <laughs> say, it again, say it again, Dale. I said, you know, the, the idea that the right hand would celebrate your, your salvation and the left hand would celebrate your being a disciple. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think there's a world of difference in the two concepts. Well, it's like I was telling, talking to Jean about this morning. It's like, mm -hmm. you know, um, disciple. What do you mean disciple? I got saved. You know, what do you mean disciple? I got to do. I, I thought I, if I just came down to the, uh, the altar and shook the preacher's hand and gave my life to the Lord and said the sinner's prayer or whatever or got baptized or whatever, I thought I thought that was it. I thought now I don't now now God won't hate me. What do you mean disciple? I, I don't I don't want to read. I don't want to ask questions. I don't want to talk to people. I mean, that's that's sort of where we are. So we have a we have a, a church full of people assuming a lot of crap. Yeah. And don't know better. And then when we point it out, you know, we're <laughs> that's when the name calling starts. And a big part of that is not just the people in the, in the pews. It's those who stand in the pulpit too, because they preach that message. Yeah, it's a means of control in the congregation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the pastor can't manipulate everybody uh, if he is a manipulating pastor all by himself. He has to have lieutenants and cronies and so you know foot soldiers and spies. So it, it really is a sick way to operate. Um, a church. It's really sick. You know, you, you're using fear, pressure, manip psychological manipulation to control people, and you can't hold a gun to somebody's head and say, "Love me or else. what if God did that? I mean, God holding a gun to your head, love me or else. Oh, I love you, Lord. Well, do you really? Do you really mean it? When did you first love me? What was the date? What was the time? Do you mean it this time? Do you mean it this time? Have you cried enough? <laughs> well, you, I can take you to the place that the Lord yeah, saved me. The Lord saved me by his wonderful grace. <laughs> I can take you to that place too. Get on the plane with me if I go on February the 8th. Oh, Lord. Did you get saved in Israel? <laughs> yes, I did. And it's not the garden tomb, right? <laughs> it ain't the garden tomb. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mercy. Well, um, it's about our time's about up, and uh, I do thank um, all of you all who are over on the live stream. I'm glad that you can see me. I've got something on my screen that says preparing live stream. I don't know if it's recording properly or not, but what I'm encouraged by is the fact that you all are listening and sending a lot of comments our way tonight, and I do appreciate that. Also, every one of you on the panel on, the, on Zoom um, seem to have been able to hear me okay, and I you okay, so... Fingers crossed that we have a good product that I can now upload to YouTube uh, after we sign off tonight. And um, so this Sunday morning, Gino, uh, your worship service, it's going to be after ours. So ours is at 10 o'clock Eastern and yours is at 11 o'clock Eastern, correct? Oh, well, you're, you're muted, bro. Yeah, there's that. Uh, yeah, 10 o'clock Central, 11 Eastern for us. Right. And then we're thinking about doing some sort of extravaganza around... Rapture maybe on February the first on Wednesday morning and night or not? Yes, we are. Okay, and then on the eighth, I prob there's a good chance I won't be here, uh, so I'll have to cancel that. But the following Wednesday, I might join Gino or and uh, from from Israel or Palestine or Jordan, wherever we happen to be. Be late in the evening for you, right? Well, yeah, favorite, favorite, favorite favorite to fly to Amman. Hmm. Where will the group be on? Where will the group be on the fifteenth? 
in uh, that seven days in Israel somewhere, probably Jerusalem. Yeah, so we'll be staying uh, in Bethlehem or Jerusalem, and I'll just get the Wi-Fi rolling, man. Um, we're staying at the Larsa, and then we're staying um, at the Golan, and then we're staying at one night in Jericho. That's cool. I've done that before. Okay. I've never been. Yeah. Yeah, it's nice. And then, and then you're, you're probably in St. Joseph. I, we're staying at St. Joseph. In Bethlehem? Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, again, I want you also to know that um, I'm going to be speaking with Peter at the Society for Biblical Studies about a Lafayette Al Rock trip of some kind uh, that would be, I hope, in March of 2024. We'll begin to set something up. I'll give you, uh, we'll start working on an itinerary and we'll get some dates going. And um, I know you have to save your money and all of that, but. Um, Maybe we can figure out a way to raise some money, too, to help people if they're a little short. I don't know, but we'll figure something out, okay? I hope you all have a blessed evening. Thank you to Patricia, especially Patricia, but also to Dale and to Jean and to Sheila and to all of our friends over on live stream. God bless all of you. And Facebook, yes. Take care. Good evening, everybody. Y'all have a blessed evening. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Upon the way.